we'll mostly be staying here, so keep that keep that chapter marked. And the first part of that chapter is it's got man that just chock full of a lot of stuff, and we won't be dealing with with much of it. But you notice there in verse two, he says, uh, "Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them." To you, and so if you remember what Paul's trying to do with all these uh, letters, you know, a lot of the churches that got started was a result of him doing what we do when we go out and knock doors and and uh, spread the gospel, and then eventually they would go back and, and contact some of these people that had uh, started meeting together, and a lot of what his work was in sending Titus or Timothy or one of these guys or sending them a letter uh, by the hands of another man. A lot of it was to say, these are the ordinances. These are the types of things. This is how you behave yourself in the house of God. Okay, these are the types of things that we're going to do. And so he's saying, I'm praising you on one sense. And then he's, he, some of the guidelines that he's given them is even how to pray and prophesy in the house of God and, and what this means about having the head covered or not covered. And I'm not going to get into that today. That would be a whole another message for another time. But then look at verse 17. He says, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Okay, so what he's saying is there are some things I hear about you guys when you come together. There's some things that you're not doing good. He's saying, I hear that there's divisions among you when you come together. And, uh, and he says, I partly believe it. There's, there, if there's divisions, that means there's some heresies or some people teaching some, uh, some wrong things. And then verse 20 is where the, the main uh, focus of this sermon starts. It says, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, let me just stop right here. I'm going to preach on the Lord's Supper or more specifically our policies of Iola Baptist Temple uh, concerning the Lord's Supper. And right away, there's a lot of different varying views out there, as there are with a lot of uh, different ordinances. And you see how they met in the house of God during those days and what they did. And we say, well, what exactly does, should that look like today? And one preacher might vary a little bit from another preacher. I believe there has to be a little bit of liberty and understanding that we might have some things wrong, we might misunderstand, but when God's people come together and they follow the, the authority of their pastor and says, hey, this is how we're going to do this, and, uh, and they're explaining that to the best of their ability through the Bible, uh, this is one of those areas where you have a little bit of liberty. There's, this is not an area to break fellowship with over somebody who might have a slightly different view. Is it closed communion? Is it open communion? Is it close communion? Should you meet in the church building or should you meet in somebody's house? Or you, there's a lot of different views out there. Okay, And so what I want to mainly talk about this morning is what I, the conclusion I've come to. A lot of it is just stuff that's been passed down to me. But then from studying the Bible, these are the policies I've come up with. And this will be important to us because this is the time of year where we normally have the Lord's Supper. And I'm going to explain that in a minute why. But uh, so it comes up and obviously so many things coming up right in this most inconvenient time with the, uh, you know, places being shut down and people being afraid to meet together and to, and to do different things. And so but that's just what it is. And so the Lord knows uh, I want to give you because I don't I know I've never done it in this setting. In Iola, I've taught this before, uh, but I want to give you our policies concerning the Lord's Supper. OK, and so he he begins right off the bat by rebuking them about the way that they're doing some things. And the way I understand verse 20, he's saying, here's what I hear. I hear that when you come together, you're not coming together to take the Lord's Supper. Okay, uh, You're coming together with all these other things, and we'll read that here in a minute. But, uh, but let me point out, first of all, just because a church has the Lord's Supper doesn't mean that that is necessarily something they're doing that's a, that's a good thing. Just because they're having the Lord's Supper doesn't mean that's something worth praising them over, as we see right here. He says, oh, yeah, you get together. This is, in this case, I do not praise you. There are some people that get together and they think that, you know, the Lord's Supper is just a party time or it's, let's, let's, let's do, you know, man, there's also all kinds of weird things out there. There, there are some people who seem to misunderstand that the Passover has been fulfilled and Jesus was the Passover and he's already fulfilled that. And so some people have kind of like 
uh, dress up time in their churches and they want to go back to being Jews and they say, hey, we got to have the Passover and here's these little, these cool little kits where you can take the Passover. No, we don't take the Passover anymore. Jesus right. fulfilled the Passover and we'll, uh, and I'll explain that here in a minute. But, uh, but then there's people that go to the other extreme and say, well, not only is this an important thing, but this is like important for my salvation. I have to take the Lord's Supper, uh, you know, or else I'm not saved. And if you would turn to John 6, I'll show you where they get that idea. But oftentimes I'll knock on the door of a uh, Catholic and they will, they will make it sound like uh, faith is the main reason, you know, main, their main hope for going to heaven. I believe in Jesus and, and, I, and I try to be good. And that's usually what they say as well. And then I, I often say, now, isn't it true that you got to do four things? You have to be baptized, right? Oh, yeah, you got to be baptized for the original sin. If they really know it, a lot of guys that a lot of people don't even know what they believe, what they're supposed to believe. They'll say, yeah, well, we got to be baptized to cleanse that original sin. And then I say, don't you also have to take the Lord's Supper? The Eucharist is what they call it. And they say, oh, yeah, well, they got to do that. You got to take that. Jesus said, you got to eat my eat my flesh and drink my blood. And so you got to do that. I'm going to explain that here in a second. Then I say, then you also have to go to the priest and confess your sins, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they usually say, well, it's been a long time since I've been to confession. <laughs> and so they got to do all these things for their uh, salvation. And then finally, yeah, they got to have faith. And so you'll say, well, don't you think that's a lot of works? Like, what if you don't do one of those things? Are you really just trusting in, you know, the Lord or are you trusting in your works? And so one of the main things that they teach, the Catholic Church teaches that a person has, they have to do is at the Mass, they have to take the Lord's Supper. And I didn't follow it all exactly, but uh, uh, it's, it's really weird that some of the flip-flopping that's going on right now uh, with everybody being under quarantine, all this kind of stuff. And, and so from what I understand... Uh, the Pope has said you can take communion at home now. And I don't know how they're doing it online kind of a thing or something. You can, you can go ahead and take your communion and, uh, and I guess he'll bless it from the TV set or something like that. <laughs> and I don't know. Uh, he also said, interestingly enough, you can uh, go straight to God. You know, you don't have to go to uh, confession or go through anybody else. At, during this time period, we'll let you go straight to God. Well, that's good because that's who we're supposed to go straight to anyway. I don't need, a, I don't need any other intercessor except Jesus Christ. And so the uh, Bible says we can go boldly before the throne of grace. But uh, anyway, it's kind of weird right now. But if you go to John chapter 6, this is where they get this idea. The phrase that is used, the, the term that's used is transubstantiation, okay? And they say that this is one of the sacraments that Jesus instituted, and you have to take this in order to be saved, and they get it from John chapter 6, and verse uh, 47 is where we'll start. Not that any man, let me see, John chapter 6, 46. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Okay, that's uh, apparently not where they start reading. They start reading verse 48. <laughs> I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. The, ble the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last, at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live, uh, and I live by the Father... So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? <laughs> to take that 
verse, to take that literally, you got to have some kind of weird ideas. <laughs> you got to eat my blood, eat my flesh and drink my blood. That sounds disgusting. That sounds like a vampire movie or something like that. And, uh, and whenever uh, I read that, I think, well, how in the world could they take that literally? I mean, he just got done saying, you got to believe on me. And then he's saying, I am that bread of life. Jesus spoke in a lot of metaphors. And he said, I came down from the Father. And, you know, you can't eat that bread. Those guys died. You need to eat, eat me. He doesn't mean literally <laughs> take a bite out of, out of, out of him. He said, he's speaking metaphorically. He's saying you need to take that. Just kind of like sometimes the prophets, God would say, eat this book. Right. And that was a picture that was representative of like taking it in and trusting and believe and believing it. I mean, there's a lot of places I could take you on that. So here's the thing. When somebody's not saved, when they haven't put their faith in Jesus Christ, it's like there's a there's like there's a veil over their face and they can't understand the Bible. And so when the Bible says, you know, you need to be baptized for the for salvation, they think that means I need to be dunked in the water in order to be saved, but that they're, they're misunderstanding the picture. Okay, the picture is that we're baptized in Christ, and whenever I dunk somebody in water and say you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, that water's not holy, that water's not special, it just gets them wet. But it's symbolic of what they've done in Christ. They've been baptized into Christ. Okay, and so, uh, uh, but somebody that doesn't understand that, they don't have Christ in them, they'll just see that and say, well, I guess I gotta get you know, baptized so that I can get saved. And someone that says, well, you gotta, uh, you got to eat his flesh and drink his blood. I probably wouldn't even say that because it sounds so weird. But, uh, but we understand what Jesus was saying. You need to consume Jesus. You, he's the one that you need to take in. Just like he said, uh, you need to take, he said to the woman at the well, he said, you need to take, uh, you, you know, you're, you're asking, you're, you, I'm asking you for a drink. But if you know who I was, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you the water that springs up into eternal life. Well, she didn't understand what he's saying, so she said, oh, give me some of this water so I never thirst again. And he's saying, this is spiritually what he's talking about. Just like Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, not Nebuchadnezzar, uh, 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 <laughs> what's his name? Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and says, what must I do to be saved? And he says, you need to be born again. How can I go into my mother's stomach and be born a second time? He says, no, 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 no. <laughs> flesh is flesh. Spirit is spirit. People have a hard time waking up and seeing the spiritual world because they only think in the flesh. And so when Jesus is telling them about eating the body and drinking the blood, he's not talking about actually eating Jesus. You say people actually believe that they're eating Jesus? They do. They do. They believe that is to be taken literally. And they say when that priest gives you the wine and he gives you the wafer, it literally in your mouth, God turns it into uh, the blood of Jesus and the flesh of Jesus. And so you become like cannibals or something, I guess. I don't <laughs> it's really strange. It's really strange. But that's what they teach. And so there, there's on one hand, there's people that take the Lord's Supper flippantly. This is party time. Hey, it's just make believe. It's just, you know, we're just having fun. And then there's another group that says, oh, no, man, you got to take this so seriously. Like if you don't take this, you're not going to heaven and everything. So obviously the Lord's Supper is a great practice. But just taking it doesn't make somebody any more spiritual than anybody else. Uh, we don't, you know, it's the, the important thing is why are they taking it? What is the purpose? And, uh, and, and that's what we want to talk about this morning. Okay, so, so let me give you a few different points here. Uh, four, I think four points here. Number one is this. There's no set time that the Lord's Supper must be taken. Now, I've heard of churches that take it every single Sunday. I've heard of other churches that take it maybe at Christmas time and at Easter time. I've heard of some churches that take it every week. I mean, every uh, month where there's five weeks, they'll take it on that fifth week. You know, I've heard a lot of different ways by which people come up with this idea. This is how often we'll take it. Is that right or wrong? I think that's a liberty. Um, that's a liberty issue where you can take it however you want. Here's all we know from the Bible. Look at, uh, uh, let me see here, verse uh, 24 and 25. Back in, uh, in the text there, 1 Corinthians 11, 24, 25, it says, he's referring back to uh, uh, when Jesus was taking the, the Last Supper, and I'll, we'll, we'll look at that here in a second. He says, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
This do in remembrance of me. He didn't say how often, did he? And in verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So he didn't tell him how often to do it. He just said, however often you do it, this is what you're going to do. You're going to remember me. This is Jesus telling his disciples. Every time you do this, it's going to become a practice that you're going to do, and you're remembering me. Okay, so uh, there wasn't necessarily a certain set time. But my policy is this. It should happen often enough that we don't just forget about it as an ordinance. I mean, there's been times throughout the, his, throughout the, the church history, I guess, where people just kind of forget some of these things that God has told us to do. This shouldn't be uh, something that we forget about. So it should happen frequently enough. And then it shouldn't be done, in my opinion, so frequently that it becomes meaningless. This is why I don't like the idea of having it every Sunday. I wouldn't condemn a, another church that decided to do it that way. But at some point, it's like not meaning anything anymore because you're just going and showing up and it's just a ritualistic type thing. When we do it, we want it to be a serious time. For me, it's ideal to do once a year. Okay, because think about that. We, we have Christmas comes once a year. It's a big day. We kind of look forward to it. By the time Christmas comes along, you know, we're ready for it. What, what does it come around now? Like October or something like that? <laughs> comes around, we're like, oh, right, I'm so ready for the Christmas season. By the end of the Christmas season, we're like, I'm done with the Christmas season. There's just something about this once a year seasonal type thing that I think is a good idea. And then more importantly, for me, it makes total sense. And I'm not saying that Jesus ever required this, but it makes total sense that you would, you would uh, celebrate this or think about this when it came time for the Passover. Now, the Passover is linked together with what we call Easter. In fact, Easter, is, the word Pasha, I think is in other languages, it sounds a lot like Passover. It's the same word as Passover, okay? And so these time periods are kind of linked together, and I'll tell you why. Let's go quickly to Exodus and, and uh, talk about this uh, first first time we see the Passover come into play. Now, once again, we do not take the Passover. Jesus fulfilled that Passover, okay? But here, from the time of Moses all the way up until when Jesus came, the, it, the Hebrews' children were supposed to do this, uh, this, this practice, this uh, ceremony, if you will, every year. And here's what it says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginnings of months, the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to him every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it in, accordance, uh, in according to the number of the souls." Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take, uh, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it uh, up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts of the up, uh, side posts and on the upper door posts of their house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh, and that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast it with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So this is where he institutes this. And this is right before the children of, uh, 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 the, the children of Israel come out of Egypt. Okay, they're in captivity, and they're under, you know, in bondage, enslaving in Egypt. And right before they come out, the last plague is that all of the firstborn in every house is going to die. And he says, 
Here's what I'm going to do, though. I'm going to pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes from. I'm going to pass over you if you take a lamb and you take that blood and you say, why in the world would, would God or, ordain for somebody to do this? It seems really weird, right? You got to take that blood. You got to kill this innocent, you know, spotless lamb. Take the blood, put it on the doorpost, on the side post and on the top. And then whenever I come through, uh, the, the destroying angel comes through to destroy the firstborn uh, children. When it comes to your house and sees that blood of the lamb, it'll pass over you. We got a song you know, <laughs> that we sing about that. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And this was symbolic. They didn't completely understand what was going on until years later when John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. They understood this. This was part of their regular tradition of killing this lamb and putting the blood on the doorpost. And now, uh, now it's beginning to unfold. And when Jesus dies and he sheds his blood, symbolically what we're doing whenever we accept Christ is we're putting the blood over the door and we're saying, you know, it's Jesus's blood that washes away my sins. Amen. You know, I'm not saved when that destroying angel comes by, by, I'm not saved because of my good works. I'm saved because he saw the blood of Christ on the, on the Amen. door. And what a wonderful picture. And so all these years they're doing this and, uh, and it's known as the Passover. Now, if you would go to Mark, now, Matthew is also a place where we have this recorded, but for whatever reason, I'm going to go to Mark. So let's go to Mark uh, chapter 14. Now here's Jesus with his disciples. And you notice right there in verse 1 that we're talking about, was, uh, you know, we're getting up close to the Passover feast. And uh, let me see here. Skip down to verse 15. Uh, or let's go to 14. And wheresoever he shall go in, uh, say ye to the good men of the house, the master, this Jesus is sending his disciples to find the lamb. Master saith, uh, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared, there make ready for us. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he began, uh, and he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with uh, me in the dish, and the Son of Man indeed goeth. Uh, sorry, the Son of Man indeed goeth as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Obviously, you know this is talking about Judas, and he goes and does what he's going to do. Good word for that man if he had never been born. Verse twenty-two. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread, and blessed and brake it, and gave to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so now this is where Jesus is instituting this new practice, okay, of what we now call the Lord's Supper, which is actually the words that's used there in 1 Corinthians. And so the Lord's Supper happen that first one that Jesus did it happened during Passover in fact they were eating a Passover lamb okay and the unleavened bread that's why we take unleavened bread for the Passover and uh, and so that happened during that same time I believe this is a discontinuation of the Passover feast because of the fact I'm talking about the way that they they took the Passover feast and uh, it was it was looking forward to Jesus coming. When Jesus fulfilled that and he was our Passover lamb, now what the New Testament church is supposed to do is look back at what Christ has already done. Okay, and so Christ said, do this in remembrance of me. I feel like it makes good sense then to just go ahead and do it around this time of year. And it just becomes a, something that we remember. We celebrate his resurrection on Easter. So it makes sense that that week before we're thinking about his suffering and how he sacrificed his flesh and his, and his blood for us. And so that is what we do. 
Uh, number two, okay, so there's no set time, but I think it should be, I, I, I like to do it once a year around Easter time. Number two, the Lord's Supper is a special time of remembrance, okay? Uh, it's, it's, it should be done orderly. It should be a serious moment. Let's go back to our text there in 1 Corinthians 11. So now, <clears throat> this is where he said, you know, I, he's saying, I praise you not in this. And he's saying, uh, when ye come together, therefore, into one place, verse 20, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, here's what they were doing. Everyone taketh before other his own supper. And one is hungry and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Uh, shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Seems to me like what they were doing is they were just using this as an opportunity to eat. You know, they probably still had a uh, lamb. It's kind of traditional around that time. They're probably still eating that. And they're coming together as, as a church, but they were getting in there and they're taking, you know, what they wanted. They weren't waiting for the other guys to come. And so uh, you had one guy, you know, he's full or, or the Bible says drunken. I don't think that's talking about alcoholic drunken. That's what we tend to think. But it means that he's, he's full of, of drink and he's full of food. You know, he's all, he's all set. But then the other people come and they're wanting to take it and there's nothing left. And so now they're, they go and they're hungry. And he's saying, I pray you not, it shouldn't be done. This is the Lord's Supper. It shouldn't be done just flippantly and just kind of being selfish and going in. And not, no organization and all that kind of stuff. I think that his, uh, the Lord's Supper is something that should be very orderly. Jesus led the first Lord's Supper, as we already read in, 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 Matthew, uh, uh, in Mark. And then he says it again here. When you go down a little bit, verse 23, he begins telling, retelling that story. Jesus took the same night in which he was betrayed, uh, in the same night he's betrayed, took bread. And when he uh, had given thanks, he break it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. You see this organization. He's saying, look, here's what we're going to do. All these have meaning. This is symbolic. I'm going to break this bread. My body was broken for you, right? This is symbolic. I'm breaking this bread. I'm going to pass it around. Everybody's going to wait, wait for each other. You know, we're going to take this together in, in, in remembrance of what Jesus did. Okay, and then he passes around the, uh, the wine or the grape juice, and he does the same thing. Jesus led in an orderly fashion, and so should we. Also, it should be something that is purposeful. Okay, not just orderly, just to, for the sake of order. Uh, but actually something that has meaning. We should be thinking about this. It should actually be meaning something to me. Why? No, it's not going to turn into Jesus' flesh in my mouth. But I am thinking about that as I'm taking this. This is what I'm, I'm remembering. Jesus shed his blood, his body was broken for me. Right? He did all this for me. He, those bruises on his back were for me. You know, that skin that was ripped off, you know, was me. That beard that was plucked out, he did that for me. And we're thinking about that, that great price that was paid. See, we preach that salvation is very simple. Receiving Christ is very simple, right? He already did all the hard work. Right. But that doesn't mean that it's, it's just cheap and it's something that's not a big deal. You know, if you really start thinking about what Jesus went through, how many of y'all ever cried about that? You know, I've seen, I'm not saying you have to. It doesn't mean you're not saved if you don't cry about it. But you ever just thought about the suffering or heard somebody preaching the details of his suffering and what happened and it just moves you to tears. So why did he do that? Why did they beat him? Why did they do all that? And he did it for us. Amen. And it should be a time where we think about that. And we're not just, hey, let me eat this cracker and drink this little Welch's grape juice and, and go about my business. This is something that should be taken very seriously. Uh, you see that at the end, um, Mark 14, 26, uh, you don't have to go there now, but you, you see when we read, I, I think I read that far, I don't remember. Uh, after they're done with this ceremony, they sing a hymn and then they leave. Okay, so it's kind of become traditional. I'm not saying that necessarily anyone's wrong if they don't do it this way, but when we end a, a service where we do the Lord's Supper, what we try to do is everybody's being quiet, everybody's being serious. We take the Lord's Supper, we sing a hymn, and then everybody just leaves. Kind of sim symbolic of, of, you know, just the seriousness of this. 
And, uh, and so that's how we usually conduct it. It's not like if you say hi to somebody or something you're, you're sitting, but I'm just saying we're keeping it serious. And, we're, and so, so we sing everything, we do everything purposeful, then we sing the song, and then we leave. Okay, third, so we saw that uh, there's no set time, uh, but it's supposed to be a special time of remembrance. It's supposed to be uh, orderly, purposeful. Number three, to be flippant about this is to disrespect Jesus. That doesn't sound like a very big deal. It doesn't sound that big. Like, who cares? Like, I wasn't super serious about eating the cracker and drinking the grape. No, according to this text, to not do this in sincerity. Now, I'm not talking about the Catholic, you know, this is required for our salvation type of a thing. But you're a child of God, and you have an opportunity to, to worship God and to think about what Jesus did for us, and you're commemorating that. To just do it flippantly and act like it's not a big deal or to be selfish and thinking about your own self. All these kinds of things. Actually, what the Bible says is to disrespect Jesus. And how many of you think you disrespect Jesus, you're going to get away with it? <laughs> no. This is actually something that could cause judgment upon a person. Look at verse uh, 27. Not, you're not going to hell if, you, if you're already saved and you, and you don't take the Lord's Supper, uh, you know, in, in the right uh, manner. That doesn't mean you're going to hell, but you could be judged for this. Look at verse uh, 27. We're in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. Wherefore, who, sa who shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord? But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means they're dead. That was a word that he would use sometimes, just dead until the resurrection. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. I'll get back to that verse in a minute. So I think that what he's saying here, the point that's being made is that a person ought to think this through and examine himself. Now, when I was a kid out here, this priest, and it would say, you know, if you're living in sin and you take the Lord's Supper and you haven't, you know, repented of that sin and all that stuff, man, you're going to get sick and you're going to and you're going to die. And I'm thinking like, you know, really, that's a chance any time of the year. If we're living in sin, that might come. <laughs> That might come to bite us, right? Because God's going to chasten us. He's like a father who chastens his son, and he's going to make sure we don't get away with certain things. And so, uh, and so, look, you should always be trying to live right, and we're all going to have, we're all going to fall into sins because we live in this flesh. But we should always be trying to do right. And certainly, this is a time that when you're you're serious and you're and you're thinking about what Jesus did for you. Seems like that'd be a good time to go to Him and say, Lord, I'm sorry that I keep messing around with this sin. Would you just cleanse me of that? And I and I want to get that right and not do that. But I don't think that this is necessarily saying, hey, if somebody's still in sin and they take the Lord's Supper, you know, you better watch out because you're going to get sick. You might even die. Uh, I don't think that's what's being taught. But as a kid, that's what I was taught. And I can actually tell you a little bit embarrassed to say this, but there were several times I did not take the Lord's Supper growing up because I was afraid I would take that and I would get sick or somebody in the church would get sick or something because I took that and I had been completely repentant of my sin. I don't believe what that's saying. I believe what he's saying is if you're just showing up, because remember the context, he's talking to these people that were already, you know, they're just going in there. And this is why he said some are sick among you and some even sleep. He's, he's talking about the specific church and he's saying, look, you guys are probably being judged for this because you've been showing up and just taking food and being greedy and all that stuff. You're not even caring about everybody else. You're certainly not taking the Lord's Supper and actually thinking about what this is for. Uh, you're just running in there and, and, and serving yourselves. And he's saying, because of this, you have, uh, what's the word that he said? He said, uh, uh, you're guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. And so, uh, so again, I leave some liberty. Different people can have a different interpretation of what this means. I do like to have a time of examination before we take the Lord's Supper and just time to pray and to get serious about what you're doing for, for the Lord. But I think the main thing is it's just saying, when you come to do this, be serious, right? It makes sense that a person needs to be saved if he's going to do that. 
Because if a, if a person comes in, let's say they, are, they do have a Catholic background, and they think that they're coming in and this is part of their salvation, look, we're, we're actually contributing to something very bad, <laughs> if that's the case. We're helping them take to, to, to think that this is part of their salvation. They need to understand that's not what it is, okay? So this, for this purpose, we are very careful about who takes the Lord's Supper. Now, this is what change is, is different in between one church and another church, okay? Some churches come in, anybody's welcome to take it if they come in. Other churches, you're allowed to come in as long as you're a Baptist. <laughs> Others, you're allowed to take it as long as you have a testimony of being saved or whatever. Well, I believe that a church, by definition, is a group of people who have been saved, baptized, and they're meeting together to serve the Lord, right, and to honor the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean there's not going to be occasional visitors that come in who aren't saved, and we want to, we want to preach to them and all that. But the main function of us meeting together and assembling as a body is because we're already saved. We're already baptized, and now we're wanting to do the work, and we're wanting to serve the Lord and learn the Bible and all this kind of stuff. So when we come together as like a church family, Right, we take in the Lord's Supper. The pastor pretty much already knows, or otherwise, they, you wouldn't be a member of the church if if you weren't saved and baptized and had a good understanding of what these kinds of things are. It helps everybody be on the same page and helps them be serious about this. And uh, and so what we what we practice is called a closed communion, which means members only. Okay, and that helps the crowd kind of be smaller. Right, because you get a big old crowd, you don't know who's doing what and what they believe, why they're taking it. You don't even know if they're saved or or whatever. And so, what we would do is make sure that these people are members of the church. And the only requirements we have for being a member of the church is that they're sa they got a you know they've confirmed that they're saved by their testimony, and then they have uh, of their mouth, I mean, and then uh, they've also been baptized, and that's like that first step of obedience. So now we say that they could be a member of the church, and they can worship together with us in that way and take part of the Lord's Supper and, and, and different things like that. And so, uh, so to me, that makes a whole lot of sense. But I'm telling you, that makes a lot of people mad. Just like baptism is a real touchy area with a lot of uh, denominations and people's, you know, depending on where they were raised. If they were raised Catholic background, some of these things are going to be very serious. Uh, when I worked with children's ministry, a lot of times the children would come in, parents didn't care. You can teach them about the gospel, parents didn't care. You can, do, you can teach them all the Bible stories and all this kind of stuff, parents didn't care. But whenever you went to their parents and say, hey, little Johnny wants to be baptized, they pull them out of church. They don't want anything to do with it. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're brainwashing my kid. I was like, we already taught them all kinds of stuff from the Bible, and the Bible says that they need to get baptized. And they, they think, no, they got to be baptized into the Catholic church or something like that. Just total misunderstanding. They don't understand that, okay? And so, so we want to make sure... Uh, even though it's a, it's a touchy area for some people, we want to make sure we're doing that right. The Lord's Supper is a touchy area for people. And I've knocked on people, uh, people's doors in Iola, and they say, hey, I used to go to that church. They say, yeah, we stopped going. Uh, I've had this at least two times, uh, probably three or four, uh, where they said, we stopped going because they wouldn't allow us to take the Lord's Supper. And so my answer to that is, why don't you take the Lord's Supper with your church? <laughs> I don't understand what the big hold of it. Well, I just don't think that you should deny me the right to take the Lord's Supper. Well, take the Lord's Supper at home then. <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't want to join a church or if you have another church and you're just traveling or something, well, wait, your church will probably have the Lord's Supper at some time. Just take it with them. Okay, it's a time for the church to remember as a body what the Lord did for us. And so there's no need for people to get bent out of shape if they show up to a church to, as a visitor and they're getting ready to do the Lord's Supper and they say, hey, this is members only. So if you're not a member, you know, we respectfully ask that you, you would leave. No reason for them to get upset, but they will. Okay, they do. And so for that reason, traditionally, we have practiced it like on a Tuesday because a Tuesday was traditionally not a day of any services. You know, Wednesdays we would meet, uh, Sundays we would meet, obviously, but we would do it on a Tuesday. And I'll send a letter out to all the members and they would come to the church on Tuesday before Easter, and we would do the Lord's Supper. Now, I'm changing that up this year. And uh, up until this very second, I didn't know what I was going to do for sure. <laughs> but I've been waiting, trying to think, trying to play some things out, okay? Here's my plan for this year. I hope this goes, goes well. I've explained to this group, all right? And in Iola, I will explain it again, like as I did last year, uh, that this is going to be for members only, and, and, and I'll explain all these details again. But I think that what we're going to do is actually take it on Easter, okay? 
So we'll have a service there in Iola, and I'll have a service here, and that'll just like conclude the service. I think I'm going to try it that way, okay? And so uh, if you come on Easter and uh, you're not a member, you can talk to me about uh, being a member. If you're not sure if you're a member, I'll tell you if we got you on record and all that. Uh, but we want to make sure that we've talked to you about salvation, baptism, and you've joined the church so you know what you're doing. Okay, because we want to make it a serious occasion, not just something where people get into it and not know what the purpose is or why they're doing it. We want it to be uh, serious. We certainly don't want anybody to be judged because they didn't, t you know, take it uh, in the right in the right manner. But here's what it says in uh, verse three, uh, 31, sorry, of our text. Verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. Now he started out saying that hey, one, these guys are eating and these other guys haven't, ate, ate, haven't eaten yet. And now he's saying when you eat tarry one for another. I think he's saying, do this collectively, do this on purpose, do this as a family. And, uh, and uh, this is the purpose of it. And if any man hunger, now, when we do the Lord's Supper, I can guarantee you, nobody's going to come here to be filled. <laughs> you got a little uh, piece of unleavened bread uh, and a little thing of grape juice, man, that's not going to fill you up. Okay. So, but back then might've been a different situation and what they had and how they, how they did it. But when you come, the point is, it's a serious matter. Don't come to be gratified in the flesh or to think you're doing some kind of, a, 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 some kind of crazy thing. You are, you are just commemorating what the Lord did for us, and it's a very sober time, and it should be serious, and it should be orderly and purposeful. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that he come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Remember, he's all talking about these orders and ordinances that he's trying to set in motion, how we uh, should conduct ourselves in the house of God. So this is a, like a, a matter, like I said, of a little bit of liberty. I believe that you should allow liberty from one church to another, but this is kind of where I stand on these things, uh, that it should be closed communion, just members only. It should be something very serious. And uh, I like the idea of finishing it up by just singing a hymn and leaving. And, uh, and, and, and just out of respect. Oh, wait, that's it. <laughs>